The roadmap I took started out with looking at an opportunity and a challenge for me. I had to put together action plans and then take it through the judging process. And then with Bowtie, you have not only the um, operations, mechanical, chassis, interior, and exterior, you also have the extra two categories of historical significance and educational significance. And then what I was able to attain and then looking at the future. Okay. Okay. I inherited my mother's car. My mother is the one who ordered this car. She bought it, she titled it, she drove it out of, the, out of the dealership. It was hers. She kept all the documentation and she chose who was allowed to actually ride at that company. <laughs> <laughs> I like the picture. Oh, this is my mother. In 1983, my mother parked the car in the driveway, or in the garage, excuse me, covered it up, never drove it again. So it had, when I inherited it, 5,720 miles on it. Wow. Why did she do that? My father's mother got sick and was hospitalized in New York. My mother's mother got sick and was hospitalized in Pennsylvania. It was not a good year, and that was the end of it. And then she didn't need to drive her car, she had my dad's. Okay. Cool. So I'll tell you more about my that in a little bit. Okay, so there it was, it was September. Was I gonna drive this car, have fun with it? Or was there something more special? That was my challenge that I had to deal with and answer. So, go ahead. Um, so the first thing I did is I went to the internet and I looked at the internet to see if there was any Corvette car clubs or anything out there and said, I found one, and I went to it, and the first thing that I was so warmly welcomed with is the guys in the, in the room said, what are you doing here, and who are you? <laughs> they feel really welcome, but it, I, it, when I had to introduce Bob and I stood up, I said, I'm looking for information. Carol, uh, Catherine and Harold Twining, which I know you guys know, spoke up, and after the meeting, because I had driven this car to that meeting, with the original tires on it, all the tires had at least 13 pounds of air in it whenever I got that car. Um, they said they would look at this car with me. We went out in the parking lot, and after some time, Harold said, what are you doing on this day? Well, it was a Paragon meeting. He goes, you need to talk to or meet Tom Dingman. So, come to Paragon. So, we drove to Paragon, Bob, our son Matthew, and I. At that point in time, Tom said he'd look at my car. He looked at my car and said, what are you doing tomorrow morning? <laughs> he said, <laughs> I was laughing. So the next morning we headed to Indiana to our first NCRS meeting. I had never heard of NCRS. So after all of this, the conclusion was my car might be a boat type. So that was my next question. What is a bow type? Bowtie car is born, it's not, it's not made, it's preserved in original condition, it can only be original once, and the reason for bow ties is to be used in flight judging and to update manuals and write those um, with originally as-built kinds of information. So what did that mean? I was told that bow tie cars are very rare and that they were only given bow ties at nationals. Um, they had to be unrestored, low mileage, because it went from 1953 to 82, there were 7, 723,842 cars built that could be used as a bow tie. Right, Warner? <laughs> I haven't had a bow tie. <laughs> but you will. Homework. Which meant that because I did get a bow tie, um, there's now 371 cars that have been awarded a bow tie for this group of cars, which makes it 0.051% of all the cars that have been built. Wow. So, this is my car, and um, it's kind of where my pieces started to fit into place, but I had to get into more detail before I could even proceed. So the first thing I did is decide what I was going to pursue. That was easy. Harold and Tom directed me to a bow tie. I had to learn as much as possible, and, and you can never stop learning because there's always so much more to pick up on this information. And thank you, Tom, for all of your help with this. Thank you, Harold, who's on his way back to Texas right now um, from the book judging conference. I had to get involved in NCRS. I had to prep my car and I had to self-judge it. And that was really educational. And I had to 
put up with Bob, who was sitting there taking pictures of me in my car in the dark with a flashlight. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, and then let the judging begin. So my goal was to vote high. I bought the technical manuals. Um, I bought the operations manual. I bought the judging reference. And I studied those. And I spent time many times I went. I volunteered at the events. And Tom asked me if I'd be membership chair. I got the opportunity to meet you. Thank you. And um, then judging schools. And then as it turned out, I went to chapter regionals and then ultimately nationals. And some of the things that I learned, because you guys had so much to share. Um, I took notes on everything. I organized them, and that was really important to me because I had to be able to go back to it quickly, even just getting ready to go to a meet. I needed to have a list that said, take this, this, and this. I um, prepped my car, I printed my judging sheets, which you guys, I'm sure, have all picked, looked at in, in the manuals or on the website. I scored my car to see how it might do. I noted deviations, and I'll show you one later. Um, I studied the judging sheets I got ultimately from chapter and from regionals, and then I had to know how to operate everything because that's part of the operations part. And then once the judging begins. So, like I said before, operations, chassis, mechanical, interior, and exterior were the base five categories uh, for both chapter and regionals. Um, I had a minimum of 10 judges, two judges for each area, and there are a lot more guys that actually helped out with this and taught me a lot. Um, <clears throat> then I had, I got my judging sheets back here and I got them back here. Um, and these were the awards that I asked to go for. <clears throat> Nationals, you don't have to do operations, but you pick up the educational and historical significance for the car. For, for bow tie, you had to score at least a minimum of 80 and 85%, depending upon if it was for mechanical or chassis or for interior exterior. And then for nationals, like I said, you had to have the last two categories, and every judge had to agree that it was historically and educationally significant to be deemed a bow tie. Okay. All right, so this was the first chapter meet. And yes, <laughs> like I am right now, a little scared. I was terrified. <laughs> I really was. But you guys are so nice. Um, this is just a, a group of the guys judging my car here. Harold, because, um, like I said in town, because of their help, significant help that made it possible. More about Bob Sedlak, uh, Mike Clancy. And then this was interesting. My mother kept all this documentation, but I went and organized it. I have a stack of documentation this high. Every single thing that came with this car, whether it was, you know, in the glove box or whether it was um, <laughs> material from the dealerships that they use for selling this thing. And whenever the judges asked me a question, and it was all right there, in the order that I was listed in the technical judging manuals. Okay. This is at regionals. This was in Auburn. And it's, they took pictures right away. This has been a family affair for this whole thing. Bob, my son, Matthew, he flew in from Utah, both for chapters and for, uh, or for regionals and for nationals to be a part of this. At regionals, lots of judges. This guy is from Nebraska, and he was he was interest, interest, instrumental in finding a really interesting situation with my car. And of course, when we got, um, I did give top flight. We got a generational award. Do you know what a generational award is? Mm -hmm. A generational award. You have to have a top flight, and it has to be given back down through the family, a car, or it has to pass down. So, and, oh, that was the Michigan contingency right in the center. And we did well as a Michigan contingent. We moved on to French Lick. Thank you, Tom, for hauling my car down there, um, as well as to regionals. Um, this is the first time when you go to nationals for a bow tie, the car goes up on a lift, so it can be seen from all angles. This is just a shot of the, shoot, of the um, showroom where it was at. And this was kind of... This, obviously, was doing mechanical, interior. Um, this was interesting. Dave McClellan was just standing by my car one day. Just standing there all by himself. So it was kind of fun. Tom came up and got him. This, this gentleman and uh, Cindy, they were, kind of, they were going through all of my documentation, my paperwork, which made it really easy. Kim, don't go on yet. Yes. On the lower right corner, 
you, you pointed to that and said, uh, room full of quarterbacks, whatever. Yep. Oh. At that particular meet, there was another room with at least as many cars. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Upstairs. Yep. Yep. And Bob's car was up there because Bob was getting his fifth star bow tie. Um, so, and, and they say that judging is supposed to be a learning experience without stress. Well, <laughs> I found that a little different, but it was really fun. It was it was fun because the people couldn't have been nicer. And it, what? Don't oh. listen to Harry. I didn't hear. <laughs> I didn't hear. Okay. Well, anyhow, and and it was fun that people couldn't have been nicer. And like I said, there's so much to learn. Okay. So this is I, I put these in because so much of the lift team because it went up the room for the first time, we're Michigan chapter members. Yes! There you go. <laughs> yeah, all right. Gary, right there. Tom, you're here. Tom, here. Um, Harold is Harold. here. Richard. Yeah, name him up. <laughs> so, um, and, and they couldn't have been nicer with it. But this was, what was really cool about this, yes, Tom? Can you explain why you needed these guys to push your car around? Because you couldn't start the car. It had it inside, and can you explain more? Exhaust gas, I guess. Yeah, it got... And that was a very tough place to push, too, because the, the, it was narrow, a lot of cars, and it was carpet. 23 cars this team pushed that day. Wow. It was work. <laughs> um, so anyhow, yeah, but a lot of these guys are from our team, Peter, um, yeah, yep. Canada from Canada. Okay, what was really what I was going to say is really fun about this thing is um, it was not only a chance for them to look at my car, but they were so willing to teach me. Like several of them came up to me and said, "Is there any questions you have about the car?" And I said, "Yeah, I have a question. That's me." <laughs> it shows you where we ended up. They were willing to take me to wherever I had to go to learn what I wanted to learn. Okay, next. Okay. So then moving into this, that, all the first four categories um, were done. Then we went into the educational significance of what was found. Is this car worthy of pre preserving and keeping to use for future purposes? What, what they were looking for was original build, things that were uniquely done by the people on the assembly line at the time of build. And I found some, they found some examples. And I just picked out a few of the ones that I thought were kind of fun. Um, this one was actually found at regionals, okay? And it's my gas tank. It is all original, but they saw, it was like this, that tag right there. And it's like big conversation and discussion. It's like, that's an SPO gas tank label. How could you have a service parts label on an original tank? They were, when the lines filled out, and they needed parts, they'd go over to <coughs> SPO, pick up those parts, bring them in, and put them on the car. The reason I know this is original, and the reason my team leader said this is absolutely guaranteed, this is my broadcast label that is put on the engine at the time of the build, and you can actually read my serial number on the broadcast label. It was original build, and they'd never seen one like this before. So, <laughs> I made a silly, a silly question, or asked a silly question, should I take off the SPO tag? And he says, no, don't you dare. When it went to nationals, I was told that they looked for this double label situation. So, that was cool that it was there. Okay, next one. <clears throat> this was kind of fun. This is just a paper bracket on my um, master cylinder label. That's all original. Um, <laughs> this was an interesting situation. One of the things they look at is the block to see if the block number matches. I was told after this was found and pictures were taken, this is the only double stamping they've seen on a block number like this. This car, this means that it was built in, um, in um, this was built in Flint, the engine was built in Flint, but this means it was assembled in the bottom number in St. Louis. And um, it's original. I mean, they hadn't seen a double stamp, so that was kind of fun to find. Yeah, Next. the V is the engine bill designation. <clears throat> okay. And, and then the other ones that had the S in it for oh. St. Louis. Yep, for St. Louis, that's right, 411786. Yep. Okay, this is where I was saying you've got to read those manuals and really know what's in them, because here it says very clearly 
that um what clearly bags are typically dated for the trust to the bags are typically date cluttered with the uh, month, in month in the year. Um, production. Uh, thank you. You can read it farther from the back. By an stamp on the white inner lining. Research has shown. Is that all you need? Yep, that's what I wanted to put. White, it's a date stamp, black ink on a white lining. Mine are, if you can see it right here and right here, they're handwritten in orange marker. So this is the kind of thing they're looking for to say, is it unique in the way that they recognized it prior to this time in how it was built? So, moving on. Okay, this was discovered at Chapter, which was really kind of fun too. Um, see how my door lock, this is my car, um, my door locks are vertical here. And the, the judges said, that's wrong, it's going to be, these doors have been taken apart. No, the doors have never been taken apart. So what they did is, at chapters, they went to the computer, they researched it, came back to the your car is correct, they were put on both ways. And this, I went out and checked at Sotheby's, I checked Meekum, and I checked a bunch of other sites advertising, and I found them, indeed, vertical and horizontal. Wow. So it was kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah. And let me ask, what is it? It's typical St. Louis, we'll just do it our way. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, so anyhow, next. This was kind of fun, and maybe if somebody can help me understand part of this, I would appreciate it. This is my spare tire, and if you look at it, you can see the sprues are all on, it's never, you know, so I took it out, you don't get out. But what was fun is, is that you can see there's a, a, a kind of cue here, you can see a white dot on the tire. This one, I figure, is because that's the placement of the wheel balance. And they use a different color for each weight. Is that what it is? Because yeah, here's yeah, a red yeah, one yeah, right yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. yeah, each color means a different weight. So yeah. the guys in the line didn't have to look. Thank you. But the machine would do that. The balancing yeah. machine would do it. I did not realize that. I've been yeah. hoping to yeah. find out. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay. So now so we can find out if you got the right weight. <laughs> 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 Very cool. <laughs> Just kidding. No, I know. But Terry McMahon and I had a great conversation at Gilmore last September on these particular wheelways because he was going through my books. It was fun. Okay, can next. I, can yes. are, those, are those the original tires on Those the are the original tires. Wow. You're not driving on those. <laughs> <laughs> because they are likely to blow out. Yeah, yeah no, I, this is, I'll tell you the story. This is the interlude. But yes, I did end up getting some more tires. But I went to, um, the internet found this um, website that said they sold them, and, and I read down through the thing, and this guy said, no, I said, this is what I want to have, and I'm reading out a book, and then I get the bill for it, before they got shipped, for the new wheels and new tires and stuff, and they, they weren't what I had ordered. And the guy swore up and down, and I called him back and said, you told me this, and he said, well, all you have to do is cut the fiberglass wheel openings out. And oh. <laughs> nice. I was not impressed. Yes, I do have wheels, the other ones, so I do take the originals off and have them stored. Good point. <laughs> this was just an example of some of the other tags that you'll find on it. What was fun is when I opened up one of the tags, it said 79. Just another mark of originality. Next. Uh, this was fun, too, I thought. <laughs> Easily amused, I guess. These are my four original tires. These tape marks are the inspector marks that shows that they judged those tires, or that they checked those tires before it was, you know, shipped out its original. I just thought that the patterns were different. <coughs> it's still there. Next. Wow. <laughs> so there's a whole bunch of tags and markings and stuff on the car. I've got a book this thick of photographs on them. And you see in the seat belts, you get them labeled here. This is the... Um, frame markings, ink, or paint marks on the water pump, I'll come back to that. Inside the front um, passenger wheel, well, of course, your letter, letter here and your process it here. This is up inside the rear quarter panel. This one is really cool. This is a ink, or thing, grease pencil. But this one I like because it has the actual date it was made on, 11-10 of 78. My car was built on 11-19 of 78 which put that right in time proximity. 
And this was interesting because this had a lot of conversation about it because this is the detail that came on my car when it came out of the dealership. The question became is it wasn't the way it was cut, built into the factory. No, it wasn't. And one of the judges said, you have to have that off by morning or, and I went to my lead and so asked questions during this thing. My lead said, don't you dare take that off because if you do, it could destroy the paint underneath and you lose more points. So, but that's there because it was original for my mom. Well, the judges know yeah. what they're doing. Kim, would you <laughs> explain what you mean by lead? Oh, my, my lead, each one of the C1, 2, 3, 4, 5 has like one person in charge of them. Brian Pierce is the lead for the C3 group. And he's the one who made the decision to keep it there. So. I think Al Sarah is still handing out those same stickers. Yeah, he's still in business. So. His kids are. His kids. I went to school with his kids. This is really cool. So, okay, next. Now, moving into the historical significance. This is my family. This is my father. This is his 1977. This is my mother. This was her 79, which is now mine. This is me. That's my first Corvette, which was a 71. I'll come back to him in a minute. My brother, his 76, and my other brother, his 78. This guy is my great uncle. And my great uncle is a cool dude, in my opinion. <laughs> I knew him, and I still am in contact. We have a good relationship I have to do with his daughter, who lives in California. This is Ernie Olson. Ernie Olson wrote, or he, he was a riding mechanic, and he was a race car driver. I could relate to what you were saying so closely, Warner, when you were talking about race car drivers, because, go to the next page if you want. I'll show you. This is... The Corvette newspaper magazine that would, used to come out in that time period, late 70s. This is an April, May 78 That's edition. John Condor's car. Early is it really? That's John Condor's yeah. car. That's interesting. Yeah, well, and this is my uncle. And this is, um, he was riding the mechanic at the time. This is Jimmy Murphy. They won the 1922 Indianapolis 500. Wow. And... He was talking, it was, what was interesting about your break stuff, is he, they actually raced the Le Mans, 1921. They won the Le Mans because he cut the pads on the brakes off by two inches, which meant that instead of stomping on the brakes, and you talked about how it stopped so quickly, they didn't pitch pull, it actually squatted down and stopped. They won the race by almost 15 minutes. I can show you a picture later if you want to see that. But that's a significant wow. historical kind of thing. <laughs> okay, next. Okay, other kind of cool facts that people have said about my car, that I've learned about my car, that would make it historically significant, um, are things like, there are 53,807 built in 1979, only 15% were sold to women. With there were more cars built that year than any other year. 12.5% were, were red, and that was the color that GM used for advertising. 17.1% had red interiors. The, my wheels were top hat style instead of the ones that came out in 78 with the silver anniversary. And I was told that was not, um, this was least popular. My car is a one family, two generation car at this point in time. And eventually will be my sons. So I make it three generations. It, at nationals, they were quite enamored with the fact that it was a mother daughter. And that was unique. But anyhow, go ahead. <laughs> what was the scariest part of this whole process? Understanding what it meant to gently clean. <laughs> if I clean my car too much, I could lose it because then they could say it was restoration. And I heard it, I can't tell you how many times, because I asked a lot. And then I was, if I cleaned it not enough, I would lose cleanliness points. So I was really walking. I felt like a very fine line. But that was really scary for me. What gave me the least nights, number, or the greatest number of lost nights sleep is the next slide. Getting my car to regionals and nationals. Bob was an angel of trying, you know, getting my car to chapter. We went to U-Haul. We rented a trailer. We rented a truck. He'd never hauled a car before. He did a great job. Thank you, Tom, so much for offering to take my car to regionals and to nationals because I found a good night's sleep. <laughs> he was amazing. Both of you guys were wonderful. Okay, so what was fun about nationals? This is the Michigan contingent. And 
I, it was a great group to be around. This, like I told you, um, Dave McQuillan, I found him at my car. Well, it caused lots of fun conversations. What were we talking about? Well, one of the fun, fun things that Dave and I did is we looked at videos of the 1921 Le Mans race on my telephone, because I have videos of it. This is um, Tom Wallace, he's a six, C6 engineer. And then this is, this is what's fun about asking questions. I was going to, when trying to learn everything I could, I actually tuned into a California Zoom meeting during the pandemic, and I asked about people and what they knew about bow ties, and what did I find out? Oh, there's a guy in New Mexico who knows about bow ties, and I said, can you give me his number? Oh, no, but we'll give him your number, and if he wants to talk to you, he will. He called me. <laughs> this is Mike Johnson, his wife, Judy. I got to meet them at Nationals. But I talked to them quite a bit beforehand. And it turns out he has the largest tanker collection, I guess, in the world. He had it at uh, um, Meekum. No, no. What is the, uh, the muscle car show in Chicago? McCacken. McCacken. He had his collection of cars mm. there. So it, you just never know who you're going to meet. This is Joanna. Turns out Joanna is also an engineer, which was kind of fun. OK, next. Um, some of the lessons I learned through this process is I was told those who are most educated are the ones that are going to do the best. Take your time with this whole process and learn all you can and see where it takes you. Uh, along the way, you'll make some wonderful friends and gain some great wisdom. If you're in doubt, like with my uh, El Cero label, ask the questions. Um, never stop learning. And when I was told, above all, strive for excellence, not perfection. So next. So how did I do? I got a 97 for chapter. I got a 98 for NAC, for regionals, and I um, I got my my judging sheets back. I sat down with those judging sheets. I put them in the computer, and I looked line by line at what every judge said. Because as you go from chapter to regionals to nationals, you mm -hmm. end up with a higher level of knowledge of judges, and those judges will pick up different things. And so I wanted to see what they saw and where the consistency was. You've got an old car like this, you're going to find rust. So what do they say? In rust, you trust. But I ended up with a 95 at nationals on chassis, 98 on mechanical, 100% on interior, exterior, and 100% on educational and historical. All right. Um, this is my bow tie award. This is my son. Like I said, we got the generational at regionals and nationals. Um, and if you want, you want to see a picture of the Lamont? Okay. Oh, this. Okay. This is. <laughs> this is my son. His first birth. <laughs> so, and this is my son today. <laughs> so. And your mom, right? And this is my mother. Yeah. And this is my mother and dad. That was their 50th wedding anniversary, Gary. My, Matthew wanted to take them to the amusement park. <laughs> so. Okay. Very good.